Hello and welcome. My name is Gary Dehart. I am the publisher of Insightful Accountant, and I would like to welcome you here today for, pardon me for reading, but uh, I can't memorize everything. Uh, but so I'd like to welcome you here today for our webinar, Three Ways Accountants Can Save Their Clients $79,000 in 2022. Um, I'm always looking forward to hearing how I can save $79,000. So I'll uh, pass this on to my accountant afterwards. Again, I'm Gary Dehart, publisher of Insightful Accountant, and I'm joined today by Dan Beck, who is the co-founder of 401Go. And I'll get into his uh, bio in just a minute, and then we'll kick this off. But I have a couple of housekeeping items that I need to cover. And again, I've got to read it, so pardon me, because this is important. So number one, this is not a CPE event. Number two, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the Q&A or the chat. I'll be monitoring those, as well as there's a couple of people from 401Go who are monitoring those as well. And if we don't get to them during the webinar or in the middle of the webinar, we have some time built in into the back end to answer questions or there'll be follow-ups uh, to your questions. Um, 401Go can reach out to you. Uh, you will receive a, a link to the replay of this event afterwards. We don't have PowerPoint slides, so there will not be a PowerPoint that goes with it. Uh, if you lose that link, you can always find it on our YouTube channel. You can just go to the website and find it there. And then lastly, yes, I've said this before, but this is not a CPE event. So, uh, and I stress that a couple of times only because somebody usually says, hey, is this a CPE event? Even though we've said it twice. So, um, so I'd like to introduce Dan Beck. Again, he's the co-founder of 401Go. And Dan has built several uh, successful businesses and he understands the plight that we small business owners and entrepreneurs um, fight every day. So out of frustration, when he couldn't find the benefits he was looking for for his businesses at a price that he could afford, he put his, I guess you would call it his entrepreneurial spirit and expertise to work uh, to build it. And through his obsession to detail, his ability to bootstrap and relentless drive, he ensures today's small businesses can afford and offer you know, world-class benefits to employees. And just as a um, just as a, a point of, of order, I don't know if that's the right term, but you know, point of note, we're actually a customer. And we ran into probably about a year ago, I guess we've, we've been on board with you guys. And um, we were at a point where like kind of same thing where we had looked at offering some benefits. It's so ridiculously expensive, even for just a, a you know, I would call it a bottom line 401k program from anybody is not affordable. And, you know, we have good months. We fortunately were in a, in a period where we're having all good months, but, uh, you know, one bad month with a big plan and you, you might not be able to fulfill it. Right. And so um, so we started researching and, and came across you guys. And as I was sharing with you before, Dan, our so far, it's been phenomenal for us. Onboarding was great. And I'm not trying to get into a sales pitch, but it's really just to say as a small business owner, I love what you've done and it's been very beneficial for us. And we haven't done our taxes yet, but I'm already seeing a very big tax benefit for me and my partner, you know, based on having, having this plan that we couldn't afford before. So, yeah. um, so Dan, uh, you want to just give, you want to tee it up just sure. a little bit, maybe just some of the high level stuff we're going to talk about. And then we'll dive into some questions that I have for you. Sure. I think just a little background always helps. Um, you know, a lot of people assume that because I'm in the 401k space, I've been here for a long time and I'm not, I'm, you know, I've, I've uh, maybe two years uh, within the industry. So my background's more in, in um, consumer products. Uh, you know, I owned a, a handful of brands sold off um, most of them. Um, also everything from a food truck to now FinTech, you know, I've been involved in um, and I've always been, you know, through these various experiences, the businesses are different and everything, you know, it always changes, but the one thing that's consistent are, you know, the employees and it's the team that I built. Um, early on, you know, I, I, I'll admit, I tried to maybe bargain hunt for um, team members and I was successful sometimes and not other times, um, but ultimately I learned it's worth paying to have really high caliber employees. Um, and obviously, you know, compensation involves more than just what their, you know, what, what their salary is. Uh, and so benefits were always important for me. Um, the first time that I, I tried to set up a 401k was honestly more for my own interest than anyone else's. Um, I was maxing out an IRA and I was just trying to, I was having good years, but writing 
bigger checks to Uncle Sam than I was, you know, writing to myself for uh, distributions um, and wanted to find a way to kind of fix that. And a 401k would have been great. It's just at the time it was impossible for a company of my size, way too complex, way too costly. Um, and, you know, I tried several years after that as well to try, you know, another time and it got a little bit better, but still um, about halfway into the process, I decided I can't do this. This is um, you know, as a small business owner, I've got other things to worry about than a 401k plan where I'm taking on some fiduciary responsibility and everything associated with it. Um, and, you know, finally, uh, after a few exits, I decided, okay, I'm going to build what I've, had, I've looked for before because I know that there's interest out there. Um, and, and that's how I got involved in 401 Go. Gotcha. And, and what was the, uh, from, oh gosh, I'm going to do this to launching. What was that time frame? Uh, about six months, actually, okay. uh, you know, and a lot of that was just assessing, um, really understanding the the size of the problem to make sure that we were really filling um, a need that was out there, not just, you know, just another product that competes with everything else. So we wanted to find, you know, what I call a blue ocean of opportunity, some place where um, it was a new market, there was new opportunity that had yet been tapped into, um, and, and small business 401ks are it. Um, you know, fewer than than uh, fifteen percent of small businesses offer a four hundred one k. So that to me tells me, hey, there's there's you know over forty million people that could really use this benefit. You're a mind reader because I was going to ask you if you had any <laughs> idea what the number was. So it's it's fifteen or is it under fifteen percent? Um, it's about fifteen. Okay, about fifteen percent of small businesses um, with you know and kind of depending on the definition of small business, depending on if it's the SBA or Department of Labor, um, that's companies from one to 150. Yeah, employees. Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, what's the, what have you found is the main reason they don't offer 401ks? Complexity. It's always the, that's, that's the number one. Um, you know, I, I found when I got started into eight weeks is kind of typical uh, to set up a 401k plan. Um, and just that number alone, I think tells you how complex it can be. It's because you're dealing with four different service providers. Um, you have a record keeper, a third party administrator, financial advisor that's doing the fund lineup. And then you have a custodian um, that's the bank holding the assets and they all have their own fee schedules, their own contracts and agreements. And, you know, they all have to kind of work together. Um, and if you have a good financial advisor, they can, they facilitate that for the most part, but you know, at the end of the day, the owner still has to make those decisions. Um, and it's just, it's a lot to take on. And unfortunately, the more I learned about it, uh, the more I realized, well, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot that could go wrong if this isn't being handled well. Um, and so that's why we decided we, we had to, we had to approach it with technology, um, which is new, you know, it, everything now within the industry is still surprisingly manual. There's a lot of PDF forms and spreadsheets being sent back and forth. And if, you know, if somebody fat fingers, uh, you know, something on the keyboard and messes something up, it can have a lot of downstream um, consequences. And so this is where, you know, we decided, hey, if we're going to do this, we need to do it right. And that means building our own technology platform from the ground up, rather than trying to layer technology on some of these old legacy systems and processes. Right. And and as I as I shared, I mean, the we went through that process, me personally, and it was, from my perspective, very smooth. Now I have I have nothing to compare it against, but it uh, it was very smooth. And you know the service that we have received or received at the beginning and continue to receive has been great. So again, what you're building, keep building it because mm -hmm. you know, keep driving it because as a small business owner, this is something that that we need. Again, it's, and I think we'll get into it kind of the you know as the importance of employee benefits and this is something that's affordable and can be set up so that actually the very little of the burden is on the employer. It can put most yeah. of the burden you know, or as much as the, the employer wants, right? So exactly. Yeah. And so I'm going a little off script here and I do have some questions that I want to jump into. So part, pardon me for reading down, but um, so, so it's less expensive right out of the pocket, right? Right out of the mm -hmm. block. I'm not having to write as big of a check to you as I might to another provider, but what are the other ways that it's saving me money as an employer? Yeah, so the plan administration and everything else is very simple and, and you know, it's, it's a fraction of what you would find with a traditional provider. Um, but where you really see some significant benefits is, is number one, and you know, the, the reason that I think a lot of people are here is 
um, retention. Uh, you know, I was ignorant to the cost of, of um, losing employees. And it's not just, you know, posting and hiring and the time and everything else that goes into it, but it's lost productivity, getting them up to speed, you know, the tribal knowledge. And then when you're in a small business, you don't have these processes and these manuals and these training programs um, that are designed to get somebody up to speed pretty quick. And so um, I, I think in a lot of ways, it's even more costly for a small business than a larger one, um, because you rely a lot on kind of that, that tribal knowledge that's gained just through experience being there. And so there's a significant um, cost with high turnover. And I think the pandemic has made it abundantly clear to everybody that people are starting to look at employment differently. Um, and they have for some time, but it, you know, it's really accelerated in the last two years where they want greater fulfillment. It's not just the paycheck. And so um, you know, some of the ways that, that we can reduce that turnover and help employees feel like they're part of family um, is by offering good benefits, uh, you know, because they know that, hey, if this business has something, you know, that these large corporations do, then that means they really care. They put some work into it. So right away, just lowering those costs of turnover, which can be very high, um, is, is, you know, the first benefit. But then on top of that, there's a lot of tax benefits to the way that we compensate those employees. So if instead of, you know, let's say you decide to implement a 401k, um, you have an employee making $50,000 a year, um, you know, they're probably going to want raises on a periodic basis. And if instead, if you're enriching them with, um, you know, benefits, uh, it's a way to reduce those costs because pay going through payroll is going to incur um, all the all the expenses that the taxes and everything else that are associated with kind of the burden rate of, a, of an employee. Um, but if it's going into the 401k, it saves the employer taxes. It also saves the participant, the, the employee on taxes as well. So it reduces all those um, payroll taxes that are associated with it. Um, and this is especially helpful for, you know, anybody that has a client um, in the construction industry, if they're doing any federal work, they're subject to, um, you know, the Davis-Bacon Act where there's uh, prevailing fringe benefits that need to be offered. And most construction companies, they just pay that out as additional compensation. They can actually save money by using that prevailing wage portion and, and giving it through a 401k because they're reducing that, you know, that, that 15 to 20 percent, um, you know, burden that's associated, you know, that goes above and beyond the salary itself. And is that tied primarily, you, you mentioned government and construct or government contracting and construction. Is that just, did you say those two together because con construction is such a big part of government contracting? Well, well it's that um, any, any contractors that are doing government work, and this may be subject to, I just know that we run across this quite often. We have um, a number of construction companies that are using our platform. And the reason they come is because it saves them money. Um, you know, a lot of people think as a, with a, of a 401k is just purely an expense to the owner, um, but it saves them money by having it in place. So right. it may apply to other federal workers, but um, if you're a contractor uh, doing, you know, any federal jobs, buildings, whatever it is, um, then those employees are subject to prevailing wage and prevailing fringe benefits. Okay. Are there any others that you can think of off the top of your mind outside of that kind of that government mandate where, where this should be, gosh, I need to be doing this right now. Yeah. For, for small business owners themselves, and this is really kind of my, the, the whole reason I attempted to set up a 401k on my own um, in the very beginning was as a small business owner, you can put over $50,000 into this 401k. And so when you're looking at, um, you know, your, your taxable income, if you need to reduce that, a 401k is a great way to do it. Um, an additional benefit is that with, um, as, a, as a small business owner, uh, you could be using an IRA, but you, you oftentimes can't use a Roth IRA because your overall um, income is too high. Uh, with a 401k, there's no limits on that. And so that's another benefit. If you really want to utilize, um, you know, the, the advantages that a Roth could provide and it makes sense for you, um, you're going to get phased out very quickly and you're going to be very limited in what you can do with an IRA. With a 401k, you can do um, up to 19500 um, Essentially, that's the amount that the employee themselves can put in. And that can be into a Roth portion of the 401k. So there's those immediate you know, tax savings right there for anybody that's using it. And oftentimes in small businesses, the business owner themselves you know, have the, the greatest, you know, the largest amount of assets in that plan. Okay. And then I don't know, I don't think we've talked about this, or I don't think this is one of my specific questions, but as we were planning for year end, mm -hmm. the safe harbor, which I yep. think that's primarily for the business owner, right? Am I wrong on that? Or the profit It sharing? is. Yeah. yeah. So safe harbor is, um, you know, it, 
essentially the the challenge with uh, 401ks for a small business is because it is such a tax benefit the irs has a long list of rules of um, okay. whether they whether they deem it's acceptable or not um, and essentially it's all subject to what's called discrimination testing where it's a series of tests that looks at you know kind of plan utilization now when you're a small business owner let's say you've got four or five employees that might be making you know a fairly small wage there early on in their career and they don't intend to participate in the 401k just the sheer nature of your business means that the owner's going to have the bulk of the assets in the 401k plan well that's going to fail a lot of these non-discrimination tests and so what the irs did is create the safe harbor provision where if your 401k has certain design requirements in, in the way that the plan is set up, then it is not subject to that discrimination testing. So um, the, the number one thing that has to be in any safe harbor plan is some form of an employer match. And essentially they're saying, look, if the employer is going to be generous enough to match the employee's um, contributions to the 401k, then, then that shows it is being set up for the benefit of everybody. Um, and so that's really why safe harbor is especially important for you know our clients because most of our clients are you know we, we have we have employers upwards of 500 employees using the platform but our average size is about 20 employees and so if the owner wants to participate in that situation they most certainly need to consider a safe harbor a safe harbor type plan and and i'm going a little off script but the your company 401 go is handling <laughs> most of that heavy lifting for let's say me as the small business owner yeah all those all those things you just lift listed mm -hmm. off that, that i hate to deal with yes and that's even if we do have a situation where um you know some of the time employers they're like i've had a lot of employees ask for this benefit myself like my business is my retirement so i'm not going to put anything into the 401k it's all going into the business uh, and so oftentimes we do find employers that don't want to use the 401k. And so they end up in a, in a traditional 401k plan. Um, and in those situations, they're, they're subject to that testing. And the industry approach to testing is similar to taxes. You kind of just find out what's going to happen at the end of the year. And you, you, know, you, you either take it or leave it. You know? right. um, and with the 401k, it's the same thing. At the end of the year, you do all your testing. And then if your plan's out of compliance, then it can take hours and days to, to make corrections. Um, you know, do refunds to the to the owner or whatever to get the plan to pass that discrimination testing. With technology, rather than wait till the end of the year to test for compliance, um, we're looking at it every time we get new payroll data um, or compensation data to to make sure that that plan's in compliance. And and we can focus more on preventative measures rather than spending hours and hours on corrective measures later on. So the platform does all of that. Uh, it handles the filing. Um, all the notices. And that's really what a lot of people don't realize is that, oh, it's just a 401k plan, but there's some really strict rules on when notices need to be sent. If they don't get sent, then, you know, there's, there's lost opportunity. There's a lot of, you know, uh, fees and penalties that can be paid. And then also, again, you're dealing with traditionally three or four different service providers, which means if something happens, then they're all kind of pointing fingers at each other, blaming, you know, well, it was their fault. This is why it didn't happen. Um, and so it makes sense to go with a, a single solution. Um, and then also, obviously, the benefits of technology. It makes it so that there's there's a far less um, chance for error. Yeah. OK, great. In our pre-conversation and when we spoke last week, um, one thing you had mentioned about when mentioned was around culture. Mm -hmm. And this is going a little bit back to the, the employee benefit, employee discussion yeah. a minute ago. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on how a company can build a culture? I mean, especially today, right? We have, well, we actually downsized. We, we went from uh, having two full-time employees plus me and my partner and a couple of contractors to pretty much outsourcing everything, but my partner and I. And um, so we, I'm in those struggles right now that you were talking about as far as, you know, the, the vacuum of information that was, it's somewhere, you know, I have yeah. to find it and, and it takes time to find it. So you definitely lose a lot of productivity there. But, you know, we were also completely remote. Mm -hmm. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. My partner's in Tucson. We had one person in LaGrange. We had one person in, in Auburn, contractor in uh, Michigan, my primary writers in Oklahoma. How do you build a culture in today's world, which is probably going to be around with us for a mm -hmm. long time? I wish I had a platform that was designed to serve that kind of culture problem. 
because mm -hmm. I feel that's even far more important than, than the 401k or health benefits or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, when, in prior businesses, the culture that I generally had was, you know, they were smaller, like the largest one was maybe 30 employees um, prior to 401 go. And it's, it's, I think a little easier to kind of have just this um, culture that exists, but also because of how small the company could be. If you do have a number of employees that are going in and out, that culture can leave as well. Or you can also develop a culture where, you know, employees get kind of passive and they're not taking responsibility um, because there's one employee that, that acts that way. And that kind of becomes the standard. And so I think that there's, um, with a small business, number one, it's easy to, it's easier to create culture because you don't have um, a, a number of departments and hundreds of employees, but it's also really easy to lose culture um, because it's oftentimes not as intentional. It's not structured. You don't have these, you know, um, ambitious statements written on the wall in the break room and everything else. And so, but but it, it I think now, um, especially the fact that we're, you know, remote, we, we have to be so much more deliberate about creating that culture. Um, and the benefits certainly weigh into it. You know, if you talk about caring or, you know, um, being financially successful or anything like that, and, and you don't have a 401k, it's a little disingenuous. And I think the 401k um, is especially, you know, one of those benefits that shows you really care because when you look at health benefits or a lot of the other ones, um, obviously I want to have healthy employees so that they're here and they're working and they're not sick. Um, and with a 401k, that's a benefit that isn't really enjoyed until they're no longer working for you. And so it's really showing that, look, I, I care about you enough that I want to help invest in your future. Um, and what we find as well is with a 401k, that just increases, there are some immediate benefits to the employer as well, because it increases their overall, especially if there's high participation, um, they become more you know, financially healthy. Uh, they start to find ways to save more money now. There's less, um, you know, less propensity for any sort of embezzlement or, or anything like that. And you don't have employees at work that are really stressing about financial issues because overall, you know, this is a tool that helps them to become uh, more financially minded. And, and again, there's going to be some immediate benefits to the employer. Yeah, and, and I think it's as you know, as a small business owner, most of us don't go into business thinking, oh, I'm going to build culture first, <laughs> yeah. right? We go in thinking, I've, I got to make the business work. Mm -hmm. The business doesn't work. There's no culture anyway. And then they throw in pandemic and throw in remote yeah. and, and us now going with a lot of contractors. It's really difficult to build culture mm -hmm. if you don't specifically make it, hey, this is a top priority yeah. for us. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, it hasn't really been, but it needs to be because well, it's, like you just said, it's important. Yeah. And along those lines, I think with the pandemic as well, and I'm sure, you know, as, as I talk with a lot of different business owners, a lot of them are questioning, they're like, look, I've got all these employees working from home. I don't know if they're like really working. Are they putting in two hours a day? And it just, you right. know, they, they feel um, very vulnerable and, and I think it's hard for a lot of them, but if you've got a very driven and, and purpose-driven organization um, we're lucky that at 401go, like we're really changing people's lives with, um, you know, with a 401k. I know it sounds silly, but um, we, we come across it all the time where people are um, kind of th this desire to be better financially is ignited through the 401k. And, and this is happening with younger employees. And so when when there's a purpose in the organization, people are going to work because they want to work because it's fulfilling. Um, and naturally the compensation, everything else has to be there. Um, but it's a lot easier to have a positive culture, not be worrying as much about what your employees might be doing working from home. Right. Absolutely. So you mentioned, uh, so we talked about culture, we talked about employees, we talked about expensive employees. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was in our in our pre-discussion, you had mentioned that um, La, is it La Puccina yes. restaurant? And because I, I think somewhere in there you had talked about, um, gosh, do I do I give a raise or do I give benefits? I can't do both. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you had mentioned you had a good example there. What can you? Yep. So La Fuccina is a company that, uh, you know, I still own it. Um, it's, it's totally passive. Um, it's actually a kind of a, a contracting uh, business. We import products from Italy um, and work with uh, architects and um, and uh, interior designers to kind of, you know, do, do design in high-end properties. Um, and so we've got a number of installers and oftentimes we like to get, you know, young ones and try to build in, you know, good work ethic. Uh, and what we found is, you know, there, there were one employee, and, I, and I've seen this happen multiple times, even, in, you know, another business that I owned where these are, you know, I, I, it's the lower quartile of both age and wage. So the young employees and they also, you know, their compensation tends to be on the lower end of the spectrum as well. 
Um, and those are often, those are the most challenging to get um, involved in, in personal finance or thinking about the future um, because it's still so far away and because they don't have a lot of disposable income. And, you know, there was one employee in particular where uh, through the 401k, he was kind of, you know, the, the idea of compounding interest is what ignited his desire. And now, um, you know, when I, when I run into him, I ask him, hey, how are things going? And he's, he's investing a lot more outside of his 401k. He's doing crypto, which I know scares a lot of people. Um, but he's, that, that desire is there. And he finds ways to make sure that he can invest into something he's passionate about. And it all started with the 401k when he was, you know, like, like 19, 20, um, just, just right out of high school. Uh, so that's really the power of, of what we're doing. And, and early on, my whole intention, the reason that, I, that we got into this business um, my, my brother is, who's been a longtime business partner as well. He's also, um, you know, one of the co-founders. And the reason that we got into this was because we felt the pain point as, um, as a, a small business owner. So really we were trying to solve problems, um, creating 401 go that, that arise around the boardroom table and over, you know, really the, 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 the past couple of years and this year in particular, as we started looking more at how our platform is being utilized, we found that you know we're, we're now more focused on the problems that are happening around the dining room table, and that to me is you know that's a that's a huge um, th that's exciting uh, because it's more than just we're not just checking a box we're not just saying yeah we got a four hundred one k so you can consider us along with everybody else you're considering when you're trying to hire uh, an an employee um, but you're really having an impact and I feel like in small businesses the the bonds and you know kind of that that familial feeling amongst the you know the owner owners and the employees is a lot greater than it is in a corporation and so again i think the 401k is a great way to really you know help people change their futures and um and that builds loyalty in, in return this this individual um he started working for me when he was because his, his dad was the warehouse manager he started working when he was i think 15 um in the summers he'd come and he's stayed with you know and he's been through several different businesses i've been involved in um because it's it's a rewarding experience for him it's not just the money um and there's good culture that he's enjoyed and you know the the 401k certainly i think has, has set him in a really good direction um but you know that's he's he's hugely valuable i'd hate to lose him <laughs> <laughs> take a lose them. Well, don't let yeah. him go. You I won't let him go. I'm going to take care, good care of him. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, he's not listening. Listening, or he's uh, he's calling you right now. He's texting right. you. Hey, I think I need a raise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, again, I just want to make sure because we've talked about a lot of things prior to this and in, in our lead up call. The um, so we talked about the expense of reaching out to like a traditional 401k uh, provider. I don't know that we had any specific numbers that you shared before. Mm -hmm. um, do you have those? Like, is there a comparison is there, or, or is, is that even fair to make a comparison? Yeah, it really, you know, like anything, um, it, it's complicated and it's messy and, it, and I don't think it should be. Um, and the nice thing with, again, with technology um, is you, because traditionally with a 401k, the way that you, help to make it more affordable um, is through economies of scale. If you've got a thousand employees and those administrative costs of, of the 401k are distributed amongst those thousand employees, it's pretty easy to, to find some cost efficiency. But when you're, let's say 20 employees, um, just, just the basics, like setting up the plan, you know, that can cost a couple thousand dollars to get to generate that plan document. Um, and a lot of work going through working with a third party administrator to put that all together. Um, and then you have the record keeper. And so it's not that they're, you know, they're, they're taking advantage of anybody. It's just the nature of, of the industry um, and everything that's happening in the manual processes that makes it expensive. So, um, you know, the averages for a small, a smaller employer, um, under 50 employees, it's about $6,500 to set up the plan the first year, and then another four to $5,000 um, each year thereafter. And that's the cost to the employer. And then on top of that, the employee through, you know, their asset fees, so asset under management fees. And typically you have, again, you know, several different service providers that are collecting those asset fees. Those are very high for the small, um, for the small plans. And they're upwards of 2.2% annual assets under management. Um, and if you can reduce that just by a percentage, people are like, oh, 1%, that's not that big a deal. 
when you compound that fee over the course of a career, let's say a 40 year career of somebody that's going to, you know, utilize their 401k, um, you know, on an average basis or whatever, that's over $300,000. Um, that, that difference between 2.2% and let's say 1% or, you know, on our platform, um, you know, it's 0.3%. And, and so that, that cost savings to the employees, oftentimes um, it's, it's far greater than what you could find anywhere else. Um, but even the administrative costs are lower. On average, we're about 60% less expensive than, than anything out there. Okay. Yeah, and I do want to clarify to you when you were talking a minute ago, you threw some numbers out and you were, there was like a 5,000 and 6,000. You mm -hmm. were referring that is to on a traditional 401k, Correct. not Provider. through yeah. your, your platform. Okay. Yeah, so for us, there's no setup fees. It's, it's basically $9 per user per month and then that small 0.3% uh, on an annual basis. Um, okay. to provide all the services they need. Um, and that covers everything. Cause that's the other thing too, that I, I was frustrating for me as a small business owner is I hire somebody to provide a 401k and then, you know, oh yeah, well, there's also this. Oh yeah, well, there's also that. And I'm like, well, I didn't, you know, that wasn't included in the fees. So it's, well, I don't make that money, but I still need to know that as the employer, you need to tell me what I'm paying. And right. so um, oftentimes they get into it and they, they think, oh, it's not that expensive. And then at the end of the year, if they total up the costs, um, they realize it's a lot more expensive than they were told. Uh, and so that's another big thing is just even the transparency of uh, fee disclosures and everything else to know really how much your 401k actually costs. Okay. And how many employees are you at now? Uh, we're about 20 employees right 20? now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you're in Utah? Yes. Well, oh, we, we have... We're yeah, we're, just, we're kind of a south of Salt Lake. So we're in Utah County. Um, it's, uh, it's about 45, maybe an hour um, drive. 45 minutes from, from Salt Lake City proper. Uh, so, you know, we're right there kind of along the Wasatch Front. We've got, uh, you know, beautiful mountains that help us know which way is north and which way is south. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to get lost. Yes. <laughs> but we do have, through. yeah, but we do have some employees that are, um, you know, around the country. So some of our engineering team and other, other support are, um, but, but most of us are here. Okay. What's been the, um, and this is, we haven't talked about this at all. This, this is just because I'm interested in the startup side. What, what's been the, would you say was the biggest or the most difficult thing that you've had to overcome that you didn't know about? So I guess the biggest surprise. Yeah, I, honestly, um, I, we were fortunate that we could bootstrap this uh, as long as we did before we went out and, and um, mm -hmm. sought venture capital. Uh, but I know for most companies, you know, most startups, really the big challenge is it's like, I've got this idea and it is a brilliant idea. Um, but ideas don't ever raise money. You've got to have something, you've got to be able to prove it. Uh, so that's oftentimes the biggest challenge is that very first stage of, of being able to devote the time, um, which requires money to, to build, you know, a minimum viable product that you can then go and demonstrate and say, Hey, you know, we, we can scale this and you can get some venture backing. Um, in prior businesses, they were always bootstrapped. And so this is the first time where I've kind of gone that um, venture capital route. And it took some time to figure out. Um, it's just like any sort of sales. You have to really understand who you're selling to and what matters and what the value proposition is. And the value proposition of what we have to offer to uh, potential investors is very different than the value proposition that we provide um, to service providers. So a lot of service providers, um, CPAs, accountants, um, uh, uh, payroll companies, they use our platform to serve their clients. Um, and the value proposition for all these individuals is very different. Uh, and so really understanding that it took some time, but then once we nailed it, it was, you know, the fundraising went quite well. Um, team dynamics are always hard. They're, they're always extremely difficult. And, and because we are ventured back, we have to scale uh, very quickly. Um, and because of what we're doing, there is such an impact and there's a lot of demand. There's regulatory tailwinds that are favoring us. We've got to scale fast. And, you know, trying to maintain those team dynamics and, you know, the cohesiveness and everything else is probably the most difficult thing. Um, whereas in prior businesses, I could grow, you know, I'd hire an employee to be another few months. I'd hire another employee. Now, you know, in the last uh, month, we've, we've hired four or five employees. So, you know, and that's going to just continue to accelerate. Right. Wow. That's great. Good, good pro problems, but good problems to have, right? I mean, yes. that's, that's great. It's the success, American success stories. I love it. Yeah. Um, so the, you mentioned regulations and we've talked about mm -hmm. that a little bit before. Uh, again, I'm in Georgia. Well, actually will use me as a good example. I'm in Georgia. My partner's in Tucson. I will go back to when we had employees and I have an employee in Alabama. Mm -hmm. Um, 
what am I worried about as an employer? Mm -hmm. Are there state mandates that I have to be concerned about from a, from a benefits perspective? Yeah. Um, either and and how do I possibly know about them? Because mm -hmm. frankly, I didn't get in the business to learn follow state regulation. <laughs> Nobody does. Yeah. Um, well, and some do. Some of the people on this call might, but <laughs> <laughs> that's their job, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I I would not want that. Uh, yeah. So fortunately, the states that you mentioned, they, they don't currently have any sort of a mandate to offer this benefit. But right now, there are 14 states that have legislation that is going to, that is requiring it now, or will be doing so in the, in the upcoming years. Um, California is probably the best example because they're kind of in the middle of it. They had a state mandate that you know, was launched a, a few years back. Um, as of June last year, if you had more than 50 employees, you were required to offer something or you could opt into the state solution, which is a lot more reporting and dealing with a government agency, which most businesses don't want to do. Um, and so that, that program there is called Cal Savers. There's also Oregon Saves. There's a number of these programs throughout the country. In general, the industry terms are called secure choice uh, mandates. Um, and so to give you an idea of how um, those are progressing, uh, about a year, year and a half ago, I think there were only seven states and we're now up to 14. Um, there's legislation that is repeatedly being proposed um, in, uh, you know, I, I know the latest infrastructure bill, it was part of that, but then it was stripped out um, to, to make this a federal mandate. And so even if you're not in a state affected by this, the likelihood of this happening is pretty high, not to mention because there are so many states that are very large states, you know, large employers um, that are affected by this, it's creating a lot more awareness as a whole across all small businesses. And so more small businesses are realizing, hey, I don't have to have an HR department and, and be at 75 employees to be able to offer this benefit. And so we're finding, you know, we're talking to a lot of, um, you know, accountants and bookkeepers and service providers that are now, you know, these questions are coming up, but they don't really know what to do with them. And so the traditional approach is, hey, here's a financial uh, service provider I use. Here's a, 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 you know, somebody that I can recommend. Um, and what we what we found is it's it doesn't have to be that complicated. You don't need to, you know, we, we work with a lot of advisors and we we encourage them to be involved in the platform. Um, but these are questions that are going to come up to, you know, a lot of the people that are on this call is, you know, I've got this mandate. And oftentimes the first time the employer finds out about it, because we have these conversations all day, every day, hey, I just got a notice from uh, from California that I've got a, you know, a $15,000 penalty waiting for me if I don't get something up and running in 30 days. And yeah. if you go the traditional route where it takes eight weeks, you're, you're in a pickle. Uh, so, you know, you've got to find something that can be done quickly. And, and there's usually notifications that are happening beforehand, but just like everything, it's, you know, it's, there's so much noise, it's hard to really find, um, you know, what do I need to be listening to? And, uh, you know, but a brightly colored envelope that says penalty on it or something like that. We generally <laughs> open those. So, right. Yeah, this is going to cost you. Um, you know, I totally, when we jumped in, we had a couple of poll questions that I wanted to throw out there. And I'm going to launch this one, and it's asking basically how many small business clients do you work with, and small business being defined as one to 150 employees. And while people answer, uh, Dan is, or did you guys? Because you supplied that question, was that because do you do you cap at 150? I think you mentioned you have a client that has 500, but is it or what's the 150 number there? Yeah, the reason we you know one to 150 is that's generally kind of a good range that depending on the organization that's that's providing the data, that's what they deem as a small business. Um, but the other significance about 150 um, is at that point there are enough traditional solutions that can um, th that can be comparable. Uh, in terms of automation, no, you know, in terms of technology, no, but from a price standpoint, uh, you know, it's, it, it can be almost as economical. Um, and once you start to get up into like two, three, four, 500, the reason we have employers that are that big is because they've grown on our platform and they've decided that um, even if they could save money elsewhere, uh, they're, they're not going to, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to leave the platform because the benefits, um, you know, and the, the lower administrative burden is, is enough to stay with us. Gotcha. Okay. And so I don't know if you can see the results there, but so about one yeah. third, we're in the one to 10, 10%, 11%, 11 to 20, 11%, 21 to 50, 33% in kind of what I would call the, the mid range at 50 to hundred, then another 11%, that hundred plus. So it's actually a good, um, representation really across the board of, of that sweet spot. 
So yeah, interesting. Those are good numbers, I think. Um, let me see what the other poll was here. Um, and then I want to dive into a couple of specific things just before we get run out of time. Um, and this is more specific to retirement plans themselves. And, you know, the question is, how many of your small business clients in that 100, 100 or 1 to 150 employees already have retirement benefits for their employees? I'll be interested to see this, to see if it ties in, I think, uh, you know, that 15% number that you shared before. We'll give this a couple more seconds here and then we'll, uh, oh, I think I closed it by accident. So I'll go ahead and share the <laughs> results. Who's Who put me in charge? Um, so like, yeah, 11% is less than five, 33% and that up to 10, 22%, 11 to 20, 11%, 20 to 50, 22% more than 50%. So, you know, I know from, these aren't hard stats or data and I'm not going to say they're statistically sound, but, you know, just from what we know about our audience, you know, most of our audience members have, you know, roughly hundred ish accounts. Now I don't know, can't tell you real detail whether that's, Hey, I do, you know, tax, you know, just taxes for 40 of those people. I'm not sure, but you know, they have a hundred small business clients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, what I see for you, for them, for the more importantly, for their clients is the opportunity that's out there to really, like you were saying in the early parts of this, impact the lives of, mm -hmm. of their employees and save themselves money. I mean, yeah, like you, you said, you had a couple of reasons you started a business for the first time you were looking to selfishly, second time it was, <laughs> it was um, less selfish, but, um, but there's lots of opportunity out there. So let's dive, actually, let me check. Let me stop sharing that. I just want to number three question. I think we want to do that later. Yeah, we're going to hold up, hold on number three. So let's dive into product process and the timing of, of what happens. Well, mm -hmm. before I do that, I don't want to bait and switch. You said you're going to tell people three ways they can say $79,000. So we have to make sure we cover that. Mm -hmm. uh, don't need lawyers calling me. Um, but so what were the, so you said three ways to name the title and save clients 79 grand. What's, um, uh, what's the two minute on that? So it was uh, culture. Number one, um, yeah. is, is the one way, because I think that even a head of benefits is going to, um, well, I don't think I know a head of benefits is going to, um, help with that re reducing, uh, that turnover. Um, secondly, it's going to attract top talent that care, um, about those, those types of benefits. Um, so having the benefits in place um, is uh, is the number two thing, um, and then the the number three thing um, is just just the 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 fact that oh I can't remember what number three was. Let me go through my notes. Yeah. Um, well, I, I imagine it was on just the tax savings, right? I mean, yes. Yeah, sorry, that's it. Yeah, yeah. the tax savings because there is um, when you look into it, if if you can any contributions that go into the four hundred one k, you're looking at you know the burdened rate for employees. Um, you know, 15% is a pretty good average. So if you're saving 15% on payroll costs, that's that's pretty significant. Right, yeah. And again, I, I keep going back to us, just, well, one, first person is, is it's the best referral, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've got a chunk of money earmarked to put in, in, you know, the profit sharing. And of that, you know, we'll say it's not a huge amount of money, but, you know, just for us, for our little business, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll probably end up this year saving probably $7,000 to $8,000 in taxes. Yeah. Plus we got money in our 401k and plus mm -hmm. we added this benefit. So, uh, and it didn't cost a whole lot. I mean, yeah. And there's, there's one other thing too, that I think is especially important for this audience is any of your clients that have a 401k, if they've set it up recently, um, there's some significant uh, tax credits that they can apply for. Um, so if your plan has auto enrollment, uh, you get $500 in a tax credit um, every year for the first three years. And then also half of your administrative costs can come back in, a, in the form of a tax credit as well. Um, and so there's, there's those additional benefits. Um, it's, you know, the maximum is 16,500 um, over a three-year period. So that alone is also a pretty big benefit. And, you know, I think a lot of small employers might not realize that's out there. So again, there's money on the table. Um, it's helpful for, uh, you know, helpful for their, their bookkeepers, their accountants, their CPAs to know of that um, so that they can, again, save them additional money. 
But it, 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 when you said that, I was like, gosh, I got to write that down. Are we going to get a <laughs> notification about that? Because I remember that on the front end when we signed up. I remember that being, hey, you know, over the next three years, get these savings. Yeah. Is that something you guys push out in a notification saying, hey, don't forget about this? Or my really my tax guy should know that, right? Um, well, I think it's a little bit of both. I believe that um, in the we have a year-end process where uh, it's kind of a process of making sure that what we have in our system aligns with what's in the payroll system so that we can you know kind of maintain compliance. And I believe at that time, it kind of notifies them um, of the, uh, you know, of the particular form or whatever it is they need to do to get that tax credit. Okay. All right. And then a couple of other questions here. And it's one is real specific to our space. Again, mm-hmm. you know, I, our, our publication serves tax and accounting uh, real heavy on the bookkeeping. About a third to 45 percent are, are in tax as well and CPAs. Mm-hmm. So we're a somewhat not, we the audience is a somewhat skeptical bunch and <laughs> because that's what they get paid to do. And they're very yes. good at it. Mm-hmm. So. What I've heard, we've got a great program. We have, I want to make sure, comparable mm-hmm. to the big boys. Yep. But we charge less. Mm-hmm. Is the comparable to the big boys? It's, is it a slim down version or is it I'm really going to be able to get what I need to get for my program? Yeah. So that was probably one of the bigger challenges of building the platform. If we were focusing on just small businesses and startup plans, um, you can kind of you don't have to build out a lot of extensibility into the platform because how do you make something simple, but also handle complexity at the same time? Um, because when you do take on a larger plan and, and about half of the plans that are on 401Go were actually existing plans that migrated away. Because oftentimes when we start working with somebody like, oh yeah, they're getting hosed over here, let's move it over to 401Go. And, and so we had to be able to accommodate those complex, um, you know, some of the complex plans that have a lot of weird uh, provisions in there. Um, and so, you know, again, it's the automation that, that simplifies all of that um, is, you know, it's, it's the, the technology stepping in uh, to make sure that something that is big and complex is messy without having to say, oh, well, well, you can't do that and you can't do that and you can't do that. So there's no limitations in terms of plan design or the way that the plan is being ran. Um, and so the next thing to look at are the funds that are on the platform. Um, and the nice thing is, you know, oftentimes this is another um, detriment to a small business. They don't have a lot of negotiating power. And they're typically, it's, it's kind of a, a one-to-one relationship with the, um, you know, those fund providers. And so you'll pay a little bit higher, you know, you're oftentimes paying like a, um, a, a fee to, to purchase certain mutual funds. $20 is pretty common. Um, also, depending on the share class, they can have a slightly higher expense ratio. And so with 401Go, um, you know, we pool all those assets to, together in terms of negotiating. I mean, they're all separate individual accounts, but the way we would negotiate with the fund providers um, is we're getting the best, you know, K share classes on all these funds. There's no trading fees. And so it's in many ways better than if somebody were to go on their own to like E-Trade and set up an account and go buy these exact same um, shares. So Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab, um, all the standard bearers that you would find in any quality, any quality 401k plan we have on our platform. So they're really, you know, the, the, there's no, there's no limitations, um, you know, as, as the company scales. So if you've got 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 employees, um, other traditional solutions are far more economical, but for that, you know, those smaller employers, 100%, you're getting all the benefits of the, of what the big guys have at a fraction of the cost. Again, we're a skeptical bunch, but, um, and, and they'll do their due diligence. So mm-hmm. um, I did just want to kind of clarify those things. Cause I, again, our, my experience, and I haven't gone out and researched a whole bunch of 401ks, but my experience was it had what we needed as a small mm-hmm. business. Um, so let me, a couple others. So on the website, we talked about, you already talked about once the $9 per employee per month. Let's just, mm-hmm. Again, clarify, we're more into product now yes. about 401 go. Um, so nine dollars a month. What else am I having to pay? Where else am I paying? Like you said, I don't want to get a surprise, you know, yeah. bill at the end of the year from 18 providers. Yep. So it's you pay a per user fee, that's nine dollars per user per month. Um, yep. and then there is a that small asset fee. Um, and, and so it's also important to understand who's paying what. So the employer pays the administrative costs. That's that $9 per user. At 50 employees, that drops to eight. At 100 employees, that drops to um, seven. So th- that does scale with size. Um, 
And the and so the only other fee that is being paid um, is by the employees because they're the ones that are putting assets into the plan, and that's that 0.3% um, of assets on an annual basis. Um, and so those are those are the only two fees. We don't have startup fees. We don't have any you know these these crazy three thousand um, dollar plan uh, conversion, essentially moving your plan somewhere else uh, fees. Um, the way we retain people isn't with, you know, fees and, and ugly contracts. It's by yeah. providing good service. So that's it. You know, the other thing too, that catches a lot of people by surprise is the compliance. They don't find out about until the end of the year, there's another fee for that. Um, you know, once the plan gets over a hundred thousand in assets, they need to have a fidelity bond in place to protect those assets. That's something the employer has to go out and get on their own. Um, and with us, that's all bundled into the platform. Um, and there are some fees that we have to pay to the custodian and everything else, but we, we take care of that. And that's part of what we charge. So um, again, it makes it super simple. You know exactly what you're paying. You know exactly what it's going to cost. As a small business owner, I, and I, I, other friends of mine who are small business owners, that is so much more important mm -hmm. to us or to me. Just I, need, I just want to know what it costs. Give me the mm -hmm. fixed cost, and then I can decide whether to buy it or not, right? Yes. On anything. And mm -hmm. so, and I can budget around that and I can plan around it. So, okay. And nine dollars per employee per per month. Month. Yeah. Right. Yep. Not not pay period. It's Correct. Just, yeah. Like, per month. Period. And that's only on active uh, users. So if you've got 10 employees, but only three of them are using it, you're only paying for those three employees. Huh. Okay. Okay. And then um, last question. And then we'll see if there are any others that come in from, from the audience. And that is, and this is relevant certainly to our market, um, and that is partner program. I know in our mm -hmm. other conversations, I know you have a partner program. What does that look like? I mean, it's $9 per employee per month. So nobody's mm -hmm. getting rich out of the partner program. Yeah. But what is it? What's, what's the purpose behind it? Mm -hmm. And what's in it? I always like to ask, what's in it for the accountant? Yeah. Or the referrer and mm -hmm. what's in it for the client, if anything. Yeah. So uh, first and foremost, I think um, one thing that's important to understand is a lot of times when you have um, tech companies, their initial thing is, you know, anything a human can do, a computer can do better. Um, and in many ways, that's true. And so we love tech and we love um, that it can uh, it can automate a lot of the administrative processes. Um, but when it comes to people's money, relationships uh, have a big impact. And so we knew from day one that we had to build a platform that wouldn't try to replace those relationships, whether it's a financial advisor or somebody that's advising that business. Um, and, and so for us, the partner program is critical in that we actually see higher success rates. And our focus isn't just on, hey, what's, what's best for the employer, but what's best for those employees as well. Um, and what we find is there's about a 12% higher participation and deferral rate when there is some form of an advisor or partner involved with that 401k plan, because we can send all the email notices we want. Um, but when somebody can walk in the door, you know, you go in and you can sit down um, next to this employee and say, hey, I noticed you're not in the 401k. Is there is there a reason? And just answer that question. And you're not a financial advisor to answer you know, a simple question. And so that's always been kind of the apprehension in the past is, you know, a lot of people will be like, I can't do anything with a 401k because I'm not, I don't have my securities license. Um, and that's not true, especially in our case, because we're a technology platform. Um, and so the, the benefits to the, um, to the advisor, uh, I'd say number one is it makes you a hero. Um, it's, it, you're, you're right, you're not going to make a ton of money off of this, but it makes you a hero that you're providing something additional um, to your client that can save them money, um, that adds value, that can hopefully retain employees, and, and by bringing that, it just it reinforces that relationship. So that's number one. Um, number two, we do have uh, compensation. And, and that's kind of tricky because some of the time, you know, CPA firms, they're, they're not allowed to take any sort of compensation. Um, but the good thing to know is that, you know, whatever that arrangement is, it doesn't increase the cost um, to, to that employer or those employees. Um, that's all part of what we do. And, and it's a way for us to say, thank you for helping us um, maintain this relationship. Because what we found is in small businesses, and, and again, my, my own personal experience, the very first person that I ever reached out to was a bookkeeper. Um, and it wasn't a lawyer. It wasn't um, a financial advisor. And so we know that, that you know, advisors, bookkeeping firms, CPAs, they're the front lines um, that, are, that are interfacing with these businesses that we're really focused on and trying to help. And so we've got to you know, find ways to work with them. 
and build a platform that they're going to love and utilize and that their clients are going to love and utilize. And that's really the partner program. Um, and, and kind of over the next year, the, the purpose is to not just, you know, is to also make it so that it becomes, um, we can refer clients to those partners because we do see that, you know, if we have a business come and work directly with us, we know they're gonna have better success if we can pair them up with somebody um, that can come in and, and provide a little bit more advice than what we're, we're, we're providing through technology. And so we're doing that now kind of on an ad hoc basis, but we do intend to roll that into the platform where now we're going to start to try to pair advisors up with clients that are coming to 401 Go. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, that ties in real well with our final poll. And uh, before I launch this poll, uh, I'm going to ask a question, and, and once the people see the poll, I understand why I ask, I'm asking the question. So, poll basically is asking, hey, do, are you interested in becoming a partner? So, again, we've got a very skeptical group who we love very much, and, um, and they're moving into tax season. So, a lot of them are pretty busy. So, the poll is, are you interested in becoming a partner? I gave you a yes or not at this time. And... But my question is, is a very long way of asking the question. Um, if they say yes, are they going to receive a thousand robocalls saying, hey, you said you wanted to hear from us. What's that follow up going to look like? Because, again, they're busy. And um, I think if, the more you can share with on that, yeah. the better. Yeah. So, so really, and, and Carly's on this call um, and, and uh, Jeff as well. And, we, you know, for us, again, relationships really matter. And so we don't, um, we, we're not, we're not using robos or, or tons of emails. I mean, it's all personalized outreach. Um, and that's also the way that we treat our clients. Um, you know, the, the businesses that are on the platform, they don't call into some call center. Um, everybody has an assigned person. So, you know, Kelly is going to take care of me. I have her email address. I have her phone number. If I have a question, I know who to call. I don't get bounced around a call center that, that hands me over to compliance and they're like, no, that's an administration problem. Um, there's somebody that, that takes care of everything for you. And they're backed up with a team of, of um, plan experts that are very specific into certain topics. Um, so that number one, you know, that's just kind of the, the whole, um, I feel like the ethos or a value that we see um, for our company is yes, we need to be technology, but we've got to make sure those relationships matter. So um, it's the same way that we approach our partners as well. Um, if somebody's interested, um, we get it. They're busy. It, it could be something as simple as, hey, if there's somebody you want to refer over, refer them over. Let's see how that experience is the first time we do all the heavy lifting. We get plans set up in literally 15 minutes. It's all done online. Um, it's a, a simple e-signature and, and we're done. It's that easy. It doesn't have to be complex. Um, and so a lot of times that's kind of our first engagement is, you know, they've got, Hey, I got a client that is going to have a significant tax burden. Let's try this out. Um, and it usually goes really well. And then suddenly they see this as a valuable benefit that they want to use with a lot more clients. Okay. So, uh, we're almost out of time. And so, you know, we have roughly half the people have said, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Half have said, no, I haven't. Um, after this, again, you're in startup mode still, or uh, probably will be for a long time. That's right. That's how it goes. Um, we're in the tax season. After tax season, are do you have plans for trade shows? Are you going to any trade shows yet? Or what is the marketing? How, how are people going to find you after their head clears in May? Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate because we really kind of tried to move into, into top gear, um, you know, just as the pandemic was kicking off. And so the trade show season's been difficult. This year, we're, we're intending to be um, at a lot of the, the big you know, provider uh, conferences. So um, you know, we're still working out that schedule, um, but we're, we intend to do more webinars, uh, just a lot of outreach. That's really where our focus is. How do we get more partners to help um, you know, uh, with, the, with the program? So I, I'm not sure exactly which shows we're going to yet. I know that we're working on that, um, but you know, if they're, if they're larger national shows will likely be there. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of, uh, the, the market's changed a lot. I've been in this space for about 15 years and it used to be kind of May 15th, 10th mm -hmm. or so. There was like, seemed like there was a show almost every week through the end of June. Yeah. And yeah. so it was like this crazy busy time. And even pre pandemic that had changed to where a lot of the shows have merged or spread out or died. Um, it will be very interesting as we come out of the pandemic to see what shows are there. I mean, the three that come to mind for me right now, Scaling New Heights, AICPA Engage. Um, there's a new one, um, 
Accounting Web has started, has one that they're launching okay. in, um, in May. It's a first time event, so who knows what it will be like, but I uh, trust the folks over there. Uh, I know they'll, I know the panels that they're putting together are very strong. Oh, and, that's awesome. You know, the hard part is is getting the bodies there, but um, and then there's you know a host of virtual. So uh, we have run out of time. I want to I want to respect your time and uh, and those of our attendees. So any any parting information you want to share? Nope. Um, 401 gocom That's a great way to find out more. You can contact us through there, and and you know we'd love to help uh, any any clients and um, help help their employees. Ultimately, that's the that's the goal. Yeah, and and as I said before, I mean we're a user, we're a customer. Um, I've told you before, if this if this business fails, I'm coming to you. You're going to be my first phone <laughs> call. And I don't anticipate this business failing, but because I, I what you're doing is impacting. It's impactful. It's, it's impacted our business, and it and and if you can find you know as a as employee or as an entrepreneur. If you can find something that's impactful and has a real genuine purpose, I mean, what a great place to be. So I love what you're building. I wish you the best success, both as a, as a customer and, and as a vendor. I mean, obviously, we're a vendor here um, of you guys. Wish you great success. Look forward to having you on more of these. And like we talked about, maybe some, some shorter benefits focused, uh, just short kind of editorial type Mm-hmm. conversations over the future yeah, so absolutely really appreciate it and um great maybe i can get out there and go skiing one day soon yes so. you're, you're more than welcome <laughs> thanks gary all right great <laughs> thanks dan appreciate it thank you everybody yep. for coming my name again is gary dehart and this is dan beck with 401 go i highly encourage you to reach out there and see what they're up to it's been good for us and i am sure that it would be good for your customers as well so thanks dan thank you everybody thank you